Hey y'all, thanks for joining us today. If you'd like to know more about all that happens around here at LifePoint, then you need to download our new app. It's got everything from message notes, upcoming events, reading plans, and even the Sunday set list. We hope this series blesses you. So check this out. But First Chronicles captures a lot about a man named David. Now, David is the ultimate rags to riches story. We love rags to riches story. We love people that start, you know, from the bottom and, and now they're here, right? We love people that, that don't have a whole lot, but they, then they make something of themselves. David's the ultimate rags to riches story. He grew up as the youngest of like eight brothers, I mean, a gaggle of brothers, yet out of being this youngest brother, he becomes the king of the land. I mean, what, what a transition. I mean, talk about being at the bottom, winding up at the top. And over his lifetime, he does some pretty amazing things. He's, he's, he's the shepherd boy that has to defend the sheep against, you know, these, these wild animals attacking. And so, you know, pretty, pretty cool to be able to say, I killed a bear. And when these animals came after my sheep, I took them down. That's impressive. And then, you know, as a teenager, he goes to war against this giant and kills him with a sling and then cuts his head off, which is just a really neat part of the story, and uh, carries around like a trophy, which I, I tend to appreciate that. I think that's a neat detail that we don't use in VBS very often with our kids. We're like, tell our kids, like, with God's help, you can, you can take down the giants in your life. And I want to be like, yeah, and with God's help, you can cut their head off with their own sword and carry it around like a trophy. That's what I think we need to be teaching kids. But anyways, just details. So, but, but between being a shepherd and being a king, he gets a job working in the palace, which is pretty neat, and then eventually becomes a king. And near the end of his life, David is known as a man after God's own heart. What a great, what a great takeaway for all of us you know, men. You don't have to be a dad, but to be known as one who is after God's own heart. Like if people were to take inventory of our passions in life, would they say we were passionate for the things of God? It's a great challenge to us. And so in his life, David had it in his heart that he wanted to build a house for God. He wanted to build a temple for the Lord. And First Chronicles shows us the journey that he goes through. And I wanna take you to the end of his journey. In First Chronicles 22, verse five, we'll read this passage, then back up and we'll talk about how do we apply this to our life. But here's what First Chronicles 22, beginning in verse five says. It says, David said, my son Solomon, he's talking about his son Solomon. He says, my son Solomon is young and inexperienced. Now you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you parents, when you look at your kids, you're like, they are young and inexperienced. See, you don't think that when you're a teenager, do you? Because when you're a teenager, you know everything and your parents know nothing. But then you become a parent and you realize you know like a way more than, than you ever gave your parents credit for. Well, David is saying, my son Solomon, he's young, he's inexperienced, and there's nothing wrong with being young and inexperienced. I mean, the only way you go from inexperienced to experienced is by getting what? Experience. And so David's acknowledging, my son is young, he doesn't know what he's doing, and he goes on and says this, my son Solomon is young and inexperienced, and the house to be built for the Lord should be of great magnificence and fame and splendor in the sight of all nations. So what David says is, what I have in my heart to build is going to be massive. It's going to be bigger than anything my son has ever seen. Better than anything the world has ever seen. And here's what he says. He says, therefore, I will make what? Say it with me if you can see it. I will make preparations. David says, what my son is about to do, I'm going to make preparations for. So David made extensive preparations before his death. David knew that this very thing that he was passionate about was going to become a project that his son undertook. So he's making preparations. There's something that we ought to be learning as dads, understanding that there is something we're passing along to our kids someday, and we are, we're gonna get ready and get them ready for that. Well, let's keep going. Verse six says, Then he called his son Solomon and charged him to build a house for the Lord, the God of Israel. David said to Solomon, my son, and look at this, you may wanna underline this in your Bibles, highlight it, maybe even write it in your notes. He says to him, my son, I had it in my heart to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. Then he says this, verse eight, but this word of the Lord came to me. You have shed much blood 
and have fought many wars. You are not to build a house for my name because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. See, David was a warrior. David had fought a lot of battles. And because of that, God says you, and because of the blood that you've shed, you're not gonna actually build the house. But look at what God says. God says this. He says, verse nine, but you will have a son who will be a man of peace and rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies on every side. His name will be Solomon, and I will grant Israel peace and quiet during his reign. He is the one who will build a house for my name. He will be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Go to verse 11. He says, now my son, the Lord be with you, and may you have success and build the house of the Lord your God as he said you would. May the Lord give you discretion and understanding when he puts you in command over Israel so that you may keep the law of the Lord your God. And then verse 13 is our last verse. Then you will have success if you are careful to observe the decrees and the laws the Lord gave Moses for Israel. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. I love this passage because you have a dad kind of charging and instructing and passing the baton to his son. Dads, every single one of us will pass the baton at some point. Every single one of us is going to be passing on to our kids the very thing that we have been passionate about. I want you to write this in your notes. I find this fascinating. What David had in his heart, Solomon held in his hands. What was it David had in his heart? A passion and a desire to build a house for the Lord. So what he had in his heart, his son wound up holding in his hands. This became Solomon's task. So what David treasured, Solomon was tasked with. I love how he says, I had it in my heart to build a house for the Lord. Think about our heart for just a minute. Our heart is one of the most overlooked aspects of our body. Yet if you go to the doctor, what's one of the first things they check? Your pulse, they listen to your heart. Your heart will tell on you. Your heart, if you have an unhealthy heart, it shows up when you slow down and you listen. And our heart is critical, not just in our physical life, but in our spiritual life, our emotional life. Proverbs chapter four, four verse 23 says it this way. Above all else, guard your heart. Think about this, above all else. I mean, what else is there? I mean, above everything that you could spend time in life pursuing, put this at the top of the list. Above making a living, above pursuing hobbies, above building a career, above even, even leading your family, guard your heart. Why is that such a big deal? He tells us, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. This means our heart is the epicenter of our life. What starts in your heart will show up in your life. And if you stop and think about it, you know, as dads and moms, the very things we are passionate about will oftentimes become our kids' purpose. What they see in us, what they see us treasure becomes the aim of their life. When they see this is valuable to mom and dad, what we begin to think as kids is if I pursue their passions and values, then I will be valuable in their sight. That's oftentimes what our kids are led to believe. So we have to be very careful about what we hold in our hearts. Think about this. David's passion became Solomon's purpose. I wonder if my passions become my kids' purpose, what will that look like in their life? Write this down in your notes. What one generation holds in their heart, the next tends to hold in their hands. Would you write that down? I know it's kind of long, but I want you to write it down. What one generation holds in their heart, the next tends to hold in their hands. Now, I put the word tends because this isn't true across the board all the time. I mean, there are, there are certainly plenty of parents that did not treasure a relationship with God, yet their kids managed to develop this passion for God. And there's certainly parents that are claiming this truth because you've had a passion for God, but your kids are wandering and you're clinging to the passage that says, if I train up my child in the way they should go when they're old, they won't depart from it. So I'm not saying this is all the time, but in many cases, what one generation holds in their heart, the next tends 
to hold in their hands. And the reason is because values are, are more caught than taught. You can tell your kids all the right things, but they're gonna learn by watching you. They're gonna figure out what's important in life by watching you. We develop our values based on what our role models around us do. And, and I mean, we know the saying, your actions speak louder than what? Your words, meaning you can say the right thing all day long, but at the end of the day, it's how are you living? It's the model that you're setting for kids. And this is a great challenge to us as dads. It's also a great, a great possibility. I mean, we get the privilege as moms and dads of shaping the next generation. Here's what I want you to know, write this down. Everyone leaves a legacy, everyone does. Everyone leaves a legacy, some on purpose and some by what? Say it with me, some by accident. Some of us have picked up a legacy that was left by accident. Maybe your parents were careless in the way they raised you. And as much as you didn't want what they did to become a part of your life, you realize that, man, there is a trickle-down effect. And one generation always impacts the next. But some of you grew up in a home where your parents left a legacy and they did it on purpose. There were things they chose to do on purpose. And, man, that's made all the difference in your life. And so parenting, listen, here's what I've learned. It's not for the faint of heart. Like parenting is tough. Parenting's not easy. Like making kids, that's easy. That's the easy part. Raising them, man, that's the challenge. And I've learned that you will parent on purpose or by accident. It, it is just a fact of life. But here's what I want you to know. Some of you, may, when you look at the family you grew up in, you're like, <laughs> Pastor Jeff, man, it wasn't good. Like I had to weed through a lot of stuff. I wanna talk today about, about leaving a legacy, leaving a legacy, because we're all gonna do that. And a lot of times we don't think about it until it's really late in the game, like ninth inning, then we're like, oh, you know what? I should probably think about what I'm passing on to my kids. But oftentimes at that point, it's too late. So how do I leave a legacy? How do I, how do I depending on the legacy I received, determine the legacy I want to leave? Now, I do want you to know that, that while many times we are impacted by the generation that went before us, the legacy that you receive does not have to be the legacy that you leave. Some of you make the decision that it stops with me. The generational curse stops with me. Generational sin stops with me. Addiction stops with me. That with my generation, we're changing things. We're turning the tide. And that's what I wanna be a part of is a church that says, I may not have received the best, but I'm going to leave the best. So I'm gonna talk about leaving a legacy on purpose. I'm gonna give you four, four thoughts. I want you to write this down, okay? The very first one is this. If you're going to leave a legacy, the first thing we've gotta do, write this down, is we've got to lay a foundation they can build on. Lay a foundation that they can build on. Would you write that down? Lay a foundation. Now, in your notes, just underline the letter L, okay? We'll come back to this. Underline the letter L, L. We're gonna lay a foundation that they can build on. So here's what happens. David says, my son Solomon is young and inexperienced. Therefore, I will make preparations for him. Meaning, I'm gonna make the, the preparation. I'm gonna get things ready for what God is going to do through him. My job as a dad is to prepare my kids for what God has prepared for them. God has a purpose and a plan for my life as well as my kids' life. And so my job is to raise them in a way that is gonna show them what a relationship with God looks like. Here at LifePoint, we do child dedications. A lot of times people will say, hey, do you baptize infants? Do you sprinkle them? And no, we don't. We don't do that because it's not a biblical example. You don't see kids and infants getting baptized. But you, what you do see and what we do is you see a charge to parents to raise up kids in a godly home. And so what we do as a church, every so often we do child dedication. It's really family dedication. And we charge parents to lay a foundation in the life of their kids, to live an example in the life of our kids so that someday when our kids go off on their own and they're gonna have a foundation that they can build on. I mean, think about a foundation for just a minute. The foundation determines the future. 
Like you should be able to look at a foundation. I remember when my kids were really young and I had my oldest Riley, we were walking through a neighborhood that was being built and I was showing him, uh, we were looking at this foundation, I was showing him where things were going to be in the house. He thought I was amazing. Like I could see what this house was going to look like and, and it's not that I could see where, the, where things were gonna be, but I could look at the foundation, look at where the pipes are run, look at where the footers were poured, and I could, by looking at the foundation, tell him what the house was going to look like. See, the foundation is a picture of the future. And as dads, we've got to be willing to lay a foundation that our kids are going to be able to build on. And, and you think about it, if you were to take a structure smash all the windows out of it, tear up the roof, sledgehammer through a bunch of the walls, you could rebuild that structure. Now, it's gonna take a while, but if the foundation is stable, you can rebuild that structure. But if the foundation is compromised and cracked and broken, then you typically have to tear the thing down and start over. I want us to be the kind of guys that lay a foundation that we can build on. And so we need to lay a foundation. As parents, the challenge is to build to, to build our kids a foundation that someday they're gonna be able to, to build on. The question I want you to think about is, is that what I'm laying in my life, in my kids' lives, is it something they can build on? Because the temptation for us as parents is to give our kids things, to take our kids to places, to, to make them the best on their little league team, to get them into the best schools. And, and what happens is we create kids who are experience rich but relationship poor. But I've never heard a you know, psychiatrist or, or even a, somebody tell me, you know what, the wheels fell off in my life when I didn't make the all-star team. You know, my world fell apart when I didn't get into private school. You know, when my dad made me drive a used car that I had to pay for, that's when I really spiraled downhill. That's not what people say. My parents made me get a job. No, it's usually I didn't have a strong relationship with my parents. I didn't, we didn't have a healthy home life. That's the foundation that gets shaky when that's not in place. And so we have the opportunity to shape that. So lay a foundation. That's, that's the first step to laying a legacy that our kids can build on. Here's the second. Write this down. Number two, set an example. Set an example. This means being the person we want our kids to become. Being the person we want them to become. An example, our kids... Our kids are typically going to mimic what we model. So, so what are you modeling? When it comes to your relationship with God, do your kids see that a relationship with God is a priority or is it an afterthought? Is it something that's important to you? Are you giving them a picture of what a relationship with God looks like? Because you cannot lead them somewhere that you have not been and are unwilling to go. So what does it look like to just simply integrate a relationship with God into life? Do your kids know that that's important? What about with your spouse? Set an example with your spouse. If you're married, what does a healthy marriage look like? You know, I love it. One of the things that my wife and I have gotten right, and we've gotten a lot of things wrong, but one of the things we've gotten right since we started this church was our, our marriage has been healthier. We've made it a priority, and we, certainly, we still have disagreements, and, and, and there's you know, certainly times we gotta work through stuff, but I love that like Tuesday rolls around and my kids are like, you guys going on a date tonight? And uh, I love it that that's something they just expect. Now, it doesn't have to be a weekly date night, but there needs to be some time together where your kids understand that this relationship is important because the greatest gift you're gonna give them is a picture of a healthy marriage. And so I want them to know, what does that look like? I want my sons to know how to treat a lady. Where are they gonna learn that? They're gonna learn that through me. They very, very, very rarely will see my wife open her car door. Now, I'm not saying you've got to do that. That's just something since we were dating. When we were dating, I would walk around, I'd open her door, I'd open it up, and then I'd, you know, she'd get in, I'd shut the door. That's just something that we've done. And so even to this day, when we go out, I'd say 90, you're right here, baby, 98%, all right, of the time, you know, and if it's like pouring down rain, I'm like, I'm gonna unlock it, let's all run for it, okay? There's those moments. But even still, I wanna drop her off. I just, I wanna treat her that way. I wanna treat her with respect. If my kids say something out of line, I mean, they know dad doesn't put up with that. I mean, one of my kids was talking about how he was at a friend's house and that friend was back talking and, and he's like, dad, that wouldn't go well if you were right there. And so I don't wanna be mean, but I want them to know this is, these are values. It's a big deal. 
I want my daughter, I want her to know this is how a gentleman treats you. And so even with my little girl, if, I'm, if her and I are going somewhere, even if it's just jumping and we're, we're driving, you know, making running an errand, I'm gonna open the door for her. Where else are they gonna learn this? Where else are they gonna learn how valuable they are? We get the chance of modeling this. It's a big deal. Setting an example, our kids are always watching, always watching how we treat people, how you treat the waiter at the restaurant, the cashier that gives you too much change. How do you treat them? Because we would all say we want kids of integrity. We want to raise up men and women of integrity. Well, they're, not, they're gonna learn that by the way they see that in us. And so set an example. Number three is this, write this down. Go the distance. Go the distance. Oh, number two, underline the word, the, the letter E, for example. So we have lay a foundation, set an example, the letter E. Number three, go the distance. Underline the G there, go. Go the distance. Go the distance. Listen, life is a race, all right? It is a very long race. It is a marathon. Once you have kids, you're in it for a while. They're around for a while. I used to say, man, you got, you got them for 18 years. I'm learning, no, actually sometimes it's longer than that. So you, you kind of signed on for a race and you don't know when the finish line is, but you're in it. Go the distance, go the distance. Making babies, that's a sprint. Raising them, that's a really long, long journey. And, and I want you to know, it's, it's a worthwhile race. I think about in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, where the apostle Paul is telling Timothy, this is his son in the faith. He says, I fought the good fight. Sometimes raising kids is a fight, isn't it? I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. You gotta keep the faith when you're raising kids because they will test your Jesus. <laughs> they will. But it's worth it, I'm telling you. It's worth it. Refuse to quit. Refuse to quit. Listen, it's gonna be tough. It's supposed to be tough. Teenagers are supposed to test the boundaries. You did, didn't you? And so don't quit. Go the distance, you gotta find your pace in this parenting thing. The trouble with parenting is Instagram. It's friends, it's neighbors. It's, you look at someone else's life and you're like, well, they got it all together. No, they don't. They're just showing you the highlight reel, okay? Nobody has it you know, as good as it seems on social media. That family picture they posted, they took 27 of those. And by the end of it, nobody wanted to smile, but they got one good one. And you look at that like, man, we, we need to be more of that. You know, it's the whole grass is greener on the other side thing. You know, it's greener for one of two reasons. You know that one's because they water it. And two, it's over the septic tank. And so <laughs> that's why it's greener. And so water your own lawn, right? Before you go rolling around your neighbor's yard, how about you take care of your own? Stop feeling like you've got to be what everybody else says is a successful family. What if a successful family is one that says I love you and still gives hugs and shares meals together throughout the week? I mean, that's, I think that's doing pretty good. I think that's doing pretty good. And so find your pace. You are graced for your race and your pace. I am graced to be Jeff Capusta, married for 20 years, father of three kids, pastor of Life Point Church. If I try to be you know, what you are supposed to be, listen, I'm not gonna do a good job at it. I can do me, I can't do you. And so you be you and I'll be me. And let's be okay that we're different, our families look different and we move at a different pace. Find your pace, find your pace. If you wanna go the distance, you gotta stay the course. You gotta stay the course. Life is full of distractions and things to pull you off course, full of things. If you're off the course, get back on it. Finish well, it's worth it, it's worth it. So go the distance, lay a foundation, set an example, go the distance. Here's number four, write this down. Number four is this, order ice cream. Order ice cream, underline the letter O, okay? Order ice cream. <laughs> it's like ice cream man. Everybody's running outside right now, don't go anywhere. What do I mean by order ice cream? Okay, what do I mean? What do I mean? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alex. So here's what I mean. I mean, don't forget that life is a gift. Don't forget that. Don't forget that we get, we get one lap, okay? 
in this thing called life. Don't be so stressed out, burned out, frazzled. Look, it, it is a gift. Children are a blessing. Have fun. Don't feel bad about it. Throw your feet up. Don't feel guilty. Enjoy. When was the last time you did something fun? I mean, let's just be real. How many of you, when you look back on your life, you remember thinking, I used to be a fun person. Raise your hand. Come on, own it right now. How many people are like, I used to be, come on, I used to be a ton of fun. There's like seven of us at Pine Valley. We got a house full of liars here. Y'all pray for us at Leland. I don't know what you got going on there. But have you ever thought about, like, I used to be a good time. What happened? What if we captured a little bit of that back? What if as parents, we're like, you know what? We're gonna order ice cream. Because I don't know if you're like me. When I go out to take my family out to eat, like, it's, I gotta like get a second mortgage now. When your kids graduate from the kids menu, oh, it gets real, real quick. I mean, one time we're at my, one of my favorite burger joints. It's closed now, so no sense in mentioning the name, but my son ordered this bacon cheeseburger and he asked for extra bacon on the side. And I was so proud, but then so angry all at the same time. Cause I'm like, do you have no idea what that costs? <laughs> but I'm proud of you, son. <laughs> but you don't, you know, it just gets, it gets crazy. And then, so there's times when they're like, hey, you guys got room for dessert? We're like, no. We have no room in the budget for dessert is what I'm, what I'm getting. So your homework this week is go get you some ice cream. Go just throw your feet up and remember that life is a gift and parenting is a gift and that yeah, there's a lot of struggle and yes, you gotta go to work, but why not spoil them every once in a while? Why not go get some ice cream? I, well, I think it would be a huge win if Brewster's and Kilwins and Coldstone was like, well, they ran out of ice cream this week. We don't, we don't know what happened, but thousands of folks showed up and they all said something about LifePoint Church and they, were, they all had kids with them. And what if, what if we just said, we're gonna enjoy this. You know, the Bible tells us that cheerful heart, a cheerful heart's good medicine. Maybe the medicine you need is gonna come in a Ben and Jerry's pint. You're gonna take your kids to the grocery store, stand in front of the ice cream aisle and be like, kids, you choose. They're like, but they're not on special this week. That's okay. Pastor said. What a, right? Because it's, man, it's hard work. And if you don't have fun every now and again, and if you don't bless those kids every now and again, you miss out, you miss out. Lay a foundation, set an example, go the distance, order ice cream. You take those letters, you get Lego. Lego, because every parent knows the power of a Lego, right? It's fun to lay down and build, but then you, you ever stepped on them in your bare feet? You don't forget that. So I figured you wouldn't forget this, okay? Lego, maybe you need to go get you a little Lego, put it on the desk, and somebody's like, what is that? You're like, I'm building something. I'm building something. What are you building? I'm building a legacy. My kids matter. So, so get you a Lego. You know, dad, you work hard. You work hard. A lot of times you show up to church on Father's Day and you know, Mother's Day is like, moms, you're awesome. Father's Day is like, get it together, dads. <laughs> I want you to know, dads, you're, you are, if you are showing up, you're already performing better than about 50% of the dads. You're doing a great job. I just wanna be that little bit, that little reminder that says, man, let's just, let's, let's think the long game. And let's continue to lay a foundation and be the example and go the distance and enjoy the ride because it's worth it. It's worth it. Would you guys pray with me? Leland, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the blessing that, you, that we have, that, that God, to think that we get to be dads. For the fathers in here, we get to be dads. That in some way, our life, is a picture of your love. That's a tall order, God. And I'll be the first to admit that I do not get this right. Sometimes my temper is short. My words can be sharp. But God, I do thank you for grace. I thank you for who you are. God, I pray that today, that you would be, that you would remind us that our life is a picture of your love that God, you would show us how to be good dads. We're figuring this thing out. So many times, God, I feel like, a, feel like I'm over my head. I feel like I'm leading my family down a path that, that I'm figuring out and I'm learning as I go. Thank you that you never leave me and you never forsake me. And Lord, I pray over our kids. I pray that 
that, that God, that we would get it right more than we get it wrong. And then when we get it wrong, you would give us the ability to own it, to show our family transparency, to show them what forgiveness and asking for forgiveness looks like. And that God, our kids would grow up and say, dad wasn't perfect, but man, he was a good dad. So God, I ask you for that. I ask for your hand of favor and blessing. I thank you for the joy, the, the promise. We're grateful for who you are. I want you to know at, at both of our locations, if you're here today and maybe there's something going on in your life and you could use somebody to talk to, you could use some prayer. We have a care team available at both locations. So I wanna encourage you to stop by our care room here at Pine Valley. It's out the double doors to the left. There in Leland, just make your way out and uh, the team will direct you towards the care room. They'll, they'll talk to you and pray with you. But I want you to know, dads, you're doing a good job. It's a worthwhile task. Let's finish well. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for who you are. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.